Welcome to the 2015 State of the Center. I'm John McDonald, Chairman of the Board of the Danforth Plant Science Center. And I want to thank all of you hardy people for being out here on this blustery, early midwinter morning. At least we're not in Fairbanks, Alaska, where it's minus 37 degrees, or in the Boston suburbs, where there's two and a half feet of snow. Today, this morning, you will learn about the substantial progress being made in each area of our mission. In 2014, the center team produced important scientific discoveries, helped generate new business opportunities around plant science, and expanded K through 12 education, science education opportunities in local schools. The St. Louis community faced large challenges in 2014. From its beginning, the Danforth Center has seen itself as not simply located in St. Louis, but as a committed participant in the region's success. That success has many forms, including growing a workforce with an education and skills to succeed in science and technology careers, and strengthening the local economy in agriculture, biotechnology, and other industries that create opportunities for many St. Louisans. Last week, KWS of Germany hosted a grand opening of its Gateway Research Center at Bridge Park. That is a tangible example of what we can accomplish when people and organizations come together for the advancement of our region. It is one example among many, and we are fortunate to be part of an outstanding innovation ecosystem. Bio St. Louis, Cortex, Helix Center, Bridge Park, the Danforth Center, and many others share a vision of a prosperous and successful St. Louis region created through the scientific and technological innovation that will improve the lives of people around the world. And several years ago, Bill Danforth said it very eloquently. Quote, here we are with an unusual opportunity to take part in, and more important, to help lead wonderful advances for our world and for our home community. We continue to work together for the common good now, if we continue to work together for the common good, if we care about who does the work rather than who gets the credit, if we continue to attract and support the most able scientists, and if we provide opportunities for entrepreneurs, we will succeed in writing a new chapter in human history and in the story of our community." Unquote. With that theme of collaboration and teamwork, in mind, this morning you will hear about the state of the Danforth Center from Bill Danforth and Jim Carrington. And after their remarks, the program will conclude with a question and answer session with Jim Carrington and Sam Fiorella. It will be moderated by Dr. Molly Klein, who, as most of you know, is a plant scientist by academic training and was the senior director of industry affairs at Monsanto before her retirement in 2010. She is a past president of the St. Louis Agribusiness Club and a longtime volunteer at the Danforth Center in various capacities. Molly, thank you for joining us again as moderator. And now, please join me in welcoming to the podium our founding chairman, who I'm pleased and relieved to say is still actively and energetically involved in the affairs of the Plant Science Center. Bill Danforth. John, thanks very much, and thanks for the great introduction, and Welcome. It's wonderful to see so many friends here, so many people who are part of the Danforth Plant Science Center. <clears throat> and before I get into my remarks, I'd just like to uh, note we have with us our first uh, president, Ernie, Ernie Jaworski, really got us started. But he was 
doing it because we really needed someone and did a terrific job. And then came Roger Beachy as our first really full-time president. And thanks for being here today, Roger. <clears throat> Now, in, in order to get myself, keep myself focused on essentials, I occasionally ask myself, what in a few words is central to our goals? And my answer today is something typically American, to build an institution. I often use Alexis de Tocqueville's classic Democracy in America, published in 1835, to understand continuities in American behavior. He noted when something broke down in France, the locals called on the authorities to fix it. In America, people summoned their neighbors and joined in fixing it themselves. In France, the method often worked better for the specific job, but in America, local action achieved more overall. When this center began, those who felt St. Louis should have a plant science center followed the American example. We asked our friends and neighbors to help. The response was magnificent. They became excited by a vision of contributing to the progress and survival of humankind, of ending starvation and of a preserving a livable environment and bringing more science-based jobs into our community. <clears throat> they, they gave time and energy and still do and spread our story. They invited people in, provided counsel and ideas, served on working committees, and when appropriate, joined their institutions to the common cause. And importantly, they, you, we, have been generously providing essential dollars that the feds and foundations do not. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Because like it or not, first-class science remains expensive, and here we are 17 years later after having worked with others to build what we immodestly now consider the greatest plant science community in the world. <clears throat> so why build an institution rather than just rally around a single problem uh, as described by de Tocqueville? And I'll give three reasons. First, we can form an institution to embody the goals closest to our hearts. Second, if we are not as talented as Mozart, Tolstoy, or Vermeer, we have to pursue, pursue our hopes and dreams, not alone, but in partnership with others who are different from the way we are. A successful institution can carry, third, a successful institution can carry forward our ideals and hopes long past our brief lifespans evolving and building as new times and new challenges require. And one point I'd add, <coughs> a success, <coughs> if you uh, want to build for the future, you have to have faith in those who will come after. That's essential. Of course, we imagined that our institution would be successful, that it would fit St. Louis, drawing on the strengths in regional institutions, and that we, in turn, would serve them and our community. Our boon that we didn't fully appreciate at the time <clears throat> was our community's wonderful spirit of cooperation and common purpose. We've been lucky to be in St. Louis, but that alone would never be enough. We will succeed or fail on our institution's accomplishments that is, on the quality and importance of the science and on making progress on our mission to benefit the world and our region. Soon you'll hear from our president, Jim Carrington, uh, as uh, John has mentioned, about what's most important, those things I just mentioned, and then he and Sam Fiorello, <coughs> COO and president of Bridge Park, will be ready for questions. But first, an intermission to present for the first, for the third time in the history of our <coughs> organization, the Newell S. Jim Knight Award 
for, to a superstar volunteer. This award recognizes exceptional dedication manifested by one, unusual diligence and willingness to take on tasks, two, an inspiring vision for the center that attracts new people to join us and stimulates the rest of us to work harder and more creative, creatively, and three, a widespread affection and respect. Now, we all know the two past two awardees. First, amazingly enough, the person whose name the award bears, Jim Knight. Will you please stand? <laughs> and, re and, remain, and, and remain standing for a minute. Second, George Fagno. George, will you please stand? <clears throat> Thank, thank you both for helping to select today's awardees, James D. Johnson III. Will you please stand? Hey. Now you all may be seated. <laughs> thank you. Jim uh, Johnson is a lifelong St. Louisan, senior vice president of Stiefel Nicolaus, he gives time and energy to worthy organizations, including St. Louis Children's Hospital, City Academy, St. Peter's Episcopal Church, and, something important to me, coach of a grandchild's soccer team. <laughs> Jim is charming, delightful, interesting, and fun. He has a great and generous heart. He became interested in our center after hearing the talk by Howard Buffett and soon became active. Since then, he has brought over 50 new people to learn about our center. He was the founding leader of the Danforth Leadership Council, one of our center's most important groups. Jim was active in recruiting great people for that organization in planning early agendas and setting the tone. He stimulated its members to donate to the center and set an excellent personal example. At one meeting, of this group, the enthusiasm just sort of got out of bounds because Jim had been so, gotten us all worked up about the center, and people began saying, maybe we could clone him. <laughs> I, I, I hate to admit this today, but even the scientists of this center, as great as they are, don't know how to clone Jim Johnson, <laughs> nor does anyone else in the world and perhaps no one ever will. But that fact underscores how, fortunately we are, how fortunate we are to have the original, the one and only, and to be able to thank him and recognize him today as a champion of the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. And I want to thank his family for participating, uh, daughter, daughter, daughter Carly uh, worked on the junior board uh, and uh, daughter, daughter Liza uh, has uh, worked in the Carrington Laboratory. With him today are his wonderful wife, Suzanne. Will you stand up? <laughs> and his mother, a friend of our center, Betty. Betty Johnson. <laughs> now, Jim. Johnson and Jim Carrington, will you please join me on the stage? Well, thank you, Dr. Danforth. Jim, it is my honor to be with you this morning. When Jim Knight was chair of the Friends Committee, he set a very high bar, a high standard for leadership and enthusiasm. I don't think there's anybody who would argue with that. Uh, in fact, he did so much for the center that we created an award for him to recognize the leadership, the passion, and the spirit uh, uh, that we hope to have not only as our chair, but to have as our uh, collective group of volunteers. Uh, so it's a tremendous honor for me today to present to you the Newell S. Jim Knight, Jr. 
volunteer award. Jim, please, on behalf of all of those here at the center, please accept this award and please accept this small gift uh, as appreciation for the terrific job that you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I am just um, incredibly honored to be standing here. I, I, this is kind of shocking to me. Um, I'm just uh, a, a worker bee kind of just pushing this place uh, because I really think, um, well, to begin with, Bill, I think what would St. Louis be without you and your vision? Uh, when Bill and uh, Virginia Weldon and, and uh, Peter Raven and uh, Roger Beachy, all these people who, who thought of this um, idea of leading with our strengths. I mean, when we think about, you know, St. Louis going forward, um, I, I just think it's, it was great vision to say, what do we do good? What do we do really well, better than anyone? And how can we push that forward? And so um, I just, number one, want to say, uh, Thanks to Bill and, and his vision and those, John McDonnell, uh, Jim Carrington, all those involved here for pushing this vision forward. And I, I feel blessed that, uh, that six years ago I walked into a, I just wanted to hear Howard Buffett speak. And uh, here I am, so <laughs> shocking. So the, so the seed was planted, I guess Bill said, 17 years ago. I refer to this place as an emerging jewel of St. Louis. I am uh, am blessed to be on the, on the board of Children's Hospital, uh, another jewel of St. Louis, you know, something that can't be taken away from us that we do really well. So we do this, uh, we do this world-class plant science uh, with, with an incredible mission, you know, to improve the human condition and kind of enhance sustainability. Uh, this is what we do better than anyone, and its mission is noble. And I mean, so how can I not rally around that? How can we not rally around as a you know, as a community. Um, I attended last year a, 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 a conversation with Jim McKelvey. Many of you may know, he's a local entrepreneur. And Jim said, um, we got one problem here, and that is this generation hasn't built anything big. Uh, you know, the, the arch was built, Washington University was built, thank goodness, um, to really put us on the map but really to identify ourselves, um, this generation needs to build something big. And so um, I say the platform has been laid and it's an economic engine of St. Louis if we feed it. And so my call out to you all and to me, I take this personally, uh, we've got to build this. We've got to take what's been given to us and make it happen. So. Support the center now, support it in your estate plan. Uh, you know, we need to nurture the jewels of St. Louis that are more than pretty ornaments, right? We need to nurture the ones that have a payback. This has a payback. So let's take this place farther. Thank you. Congratulations, Jim, and thank you for everything that you've done. We wouldn't be as far as we are without you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Danforth, for your remarks, and thank you all uh, in attendance. We have a full house, all of our scientists, staff, friends, volunteers, and supporters. Uh, we have some special guests here. You're all special, um, but, but I'll point out a few as we go along. Uh, before my remarks about the state of the center, I want to recognize one more person who has served us so well, and that is our outgoing chairman of our Friends Committee. For the past two years, Jay Noose has worked tirely to chair quarterly meetings, host lunches, uh, and on occasions too numerous to mention, represent the Danforth Center, the Friends, our volunteers. Um, we wouldn't be as far without Jay Noose as we are today. In fact, Jay, uh, you follow on uh, and hand over uh, the chairmanship of the Friends Committee to a terrific individual, Molly Klein. Uh, but before we do that, Jay, please stand up and be recognized. Thank you. 
Well, as all of you know, most of you know, I think, the needs to feed and power a growing, changing world while also preserving the environment and vital natural resources are among our greatest global challenges. Sustainably providing for over 9 billion people by the, million of, uh, by the middle of the century uh, is a daunting task. It's going to require that we increase available food by at least 50 percent, dramatically lower the environmental footprint of agriculture, and achieve a major shift toward renewable sources of energy. Over the next 40 years, the world needs to produce more food than all that was produced in agriculture over the last 8,000 years combined. That means worldwide productivity will need to increase by roughly 50 percent, but without any more land and without more water dedicated to agriculture, with fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll need to do it in the face of climate change and escalating problems with pests and diseases. These challenges, and this is a scary thought, these challenges are not solvable in a sustainable way using current capacity, current systems, and current technology. But make no mistake, these are not only year 2050 challenges. These are today challenges. Consider a couple of facts. Today, nearly 900 million people are food insecure around the world. An alarming 26 billion tons of topsoil is already being lost every year from primarily agricultural land. Erosion rates are about 10 times higher than soil replenishment rates. It's 10, 10 times in this country. Go to India and it's three to four times higher. Agriculture already contributes 10% of our overall greenhouse gas emissions. That needs to come down. And 70% of all water that we use on Earth for uh, society is already used for agriculture, primarily for irrigation. Water is a particularly improved, in, intriguing problem for two major reasons as we go forward. Rainfall will become less predictable in agricultural growing regions, and water will become a more competitive, a more depleted, a more restricted, and a more expensive natural resource. Just to put some reality on the needs for water, I've got this fun chart that I'd like you to have a look at. How much water does it take to produce some things that all of you consume, most of you consume? Uh, it takes 14 gallons of water to produce one orange. All right, that's not so bad. Oranges are pretty good. I like oranges. Uh, put another way, uh, if you went to your kitchen, turn your faucet on full blast, you'd have to run your faucet for about five and a half minutes to put out the water to make one orange. 28 gallons, or just over 11 minutes to produce an avocado. A uh, loaf of bread, OK, now we're talking some serious water here. 150 gallons to produce one loaf of bread. That's running your faucet for 60 minutes on a high. We haven't even got to meat. It takes 400 gallons to raise one chicken. Turn your kitchen faucet on for almost three hours. Uh, but if you want to have a hamburger, or better yet, if you want to have a hamburger for your family of four, you need, for that one hamburger, about 4,000, uh, uh, you need 1,020 um, uh, uh, gallons, or the amount of time running your faucet for almost seven hours to make that one hamburger, family of four, goes up to over 4,000. Um, for that one hamburger, if you want to put tomato on it, it's 1,021. <coughs> The reason I mentioned tomatoes, it only takes three gallons to raise a tomato. That's actually why we study tomatoes. Tomatoes are pretty water efficient. It's a fascinating crop. Meeting global challenges at the nexus of food, water, and energy today and tomorrow will require significant new investment in science and technology. We can't get where we need to be with today's tools. That's what motivates us every day at the Danforth Center. Now, if the center does its part, We'll understand better how plants work in changing environments, drier environments, for example. Uh, we'll use that technology to improve productivity and sustainability of food, energy, and industrial crops. We'll develop technologies that are taken up by the private sector. But we'll also give that technology to those most in need in developing regions. And we'll help create 
innovative startups and attract leading edge companies to the region. And we'll produce well-trained plant scientists who will guide the next generation. These are the outcomes that matter to us. How are we doing it? How do we ensure that our work and our output, our activities, lead to important outcomes? The magic ingredient, the secret in the sauce, is teamwork, collaboration, and partnership, our theme today. You need to understand that science, our primary function is a team sport. That's because scientific research, building new technologies, and solving problems are really, really hard. They require teams of interactive scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, engineers, practitioners, and educators. Teams at the Danforth Center develop unique platforms for discovery, application, and outreach. And then we partner with organizations that are best positioned in the region, the country, and the world to solve real problems where they exist. We were very productive in 2014. Our research programs made amazing discoveries, I'll talk about a few today, that were described and disseminated in 99 journal articles, that's a record for us. We advanced several crop improvement programs through 10 important field trials in three different countries. We were successful competing for grants, 13.9 million for the year, another record, and in training our young scientists. In fact, we hosted our 529th trainee since inception. And through our science education program, again, which I'll talk about later, we reached 1,968 students in 38 schools, 16 of which were City of St. Louis public schools. And it was nearly all done in collaborative teams. 88% of our published research articles were collaborative works between two or more labs or institutions. Two-thirds of our grant funding was for multi-institutional collaborative projects. And as I'll discuss later, much of our education and outreach involves team comprised of education and outreach professionals and scientists in our labs. For us, collaboration is bedrock. In fact, if you chart who interacts with who at the Danforth Center, which is shown up here, you get this fascinating map that shows we are a large interconnected network. Now, what I'm showing up here is what we call a network map. There's a dot for all of the scientists at the center. If it's red, it's one of our PIs. If it's blue, it's one of the rest of our scientific staff, postdoctoral scientists, graduate students, technicians, and others. If you're green up here, you're a collaborating partner at another institution. Noah Fallgren produced this map yesterday. What it shows is that we function in teams. Oops, excuse me. This cluster down here, that's our international crop improvement program. That's showing actually three different projects or clusters that are happening in teams at the Danforth Center to improve one of eight food security crops. Right here, that's the team that's working to develop camelina and other seed crops as an alternative source of jet fuel. Up here, I could tell all of our scientists are looking at this and saying, where am I, where am I on this map? <laughs> this is a cluster that is working on a Department of Energy program uh, that is spearheaded by Ivan Baxter Tom Brittnell and Todd Mockler, those three of whom are right there. And they connect with this big mass here, which I'll talk with in just a moment. We have some individual labs out here who connect with their PI. That's my lab, and that's me. <laughs> the point of this, we work in teams, but those teams are interconnected. So let me give you a few examples of the power of team at the Danforth Center. First. One of our favorite teams, the Bellwether Phenotyping Team. This is a remarkable group that has developed a new platform for discovery to understand how environment interacts with plants, plant genetics, to affect plant performance. That's what phenotype is, the collective uh, set of properties that define plant performance. The team involves 21 people from seven labs and two core facilities at the center. Where does it fit in here? That's this cluster right here, this dense 
a convergence of many people, the phenotyping team, coupled with another group I'll mention uh, in a few minutes, is at the center of activity here at the Danforth Center. In 2014, that cluster, those 21 individuals, took a new automated system to continuously measure plant traits and turned it into a productive tool that works around the clock. They tackled the issue of water initially. More specifically, they tackled the problem of why some plants are more sensitive to drought than others. They studied the difference in drought sensitivity. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to get into any data. Uh, this is just a gee whiz wow slide uh, showing you that we can collect lots of data with the bellwether system. They studied the differences in drought sensitivity between a domesticated, that is a crop, and a wild species, that is something that we collected out in a native landscape, uh, domesticated and wild species of Ceteria, which includes, it's a type of millet. Work here at the center is diving deep into the genetic variation of Ceteria from different geographies. The team captured nearly 80,000 images over four weeks using three types of cameras, and then they mined information about nine traits using computer vision software that was developed right here at the center. They discovered that different Ceteria species respond differently over time to low water conditions, and that this is a genetically programmed trait that affects plant growth. That's important information that breeders can use to improve millet, an important food security crop for millions in the semi-arid tropics. Many of the bellwether phenotyping team are also part of the maker team, a group of 45 Danforth Center scientists, staff, and trainees who are spearheading the design and construction of low-cost instruments and software engineering tools to address specific research needs. The maker group helps with cross-disciplinary training for postdoctoral scientists, graduate students, technicians, uh, even old people like me, uh, and even high school students and others. Uh, the cross-disciplinary training uh, is at the nexus of computer science engineering, and it uses tools like 3D printing, uh, and some outcomes are things like instrument prototypes. Maker instruments are low cost, but accurate sensors and cameras, and other devices connected to cheap $35 Raspberry Pi computers. You'll like this one, Roger. There are alternatives to expensive commercial equipment. And as you know, that expensive commercial equipment can run into the millions of dollars. And they're adaptable to both laboratory and field settings. On the screen is an example of an ultra-sensitive fluorescence imaging system that Meter Nusenau built to show spread of a virus in two infected plants, the plants at 2 o'clock and 8 o'clock. Over 60% of the labs, as well as the education and outreach program, are using uh, 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 maker instruments or building maker tools or using uh, maker approaches in education and outreach. And our new building will have a dedicated collaborative maker space to encourage and expand this program. Several team members are bringing the Danforth Center maker movement or uh, are, are taking it out of the center and bringing it to the public. That's going to happen this Saturday at the first Raspberry Pi Jam here at the center. You can go online and learn more about this. By the way, you're all invited. The event, which currently has over 250 registrants, we're not sure how we're going to fit them all in, uh, but we encourage every one of them, will provide an unintimidating atmosphere to introduce plant science, computer science, and the maker culture to the public. The jam includes tours, demonstrations, uh, robots, learn to solder stations, and much more. You're all welcome, as I mentioned. Now, I want to recognize some of the key people who are leading both the Bellwether phenotyping uh, team, the Maker team, and the Raspberry Pi Jam, uh, which will occur on Saturday. So, uh, when I call your name, please stand. And after they're all standing, please give them a round of applause. Dimitri Nusenow, Ivan Baxter, Malia Guillen, Noah Falgren, Carrie Gilbert, Mindy Wilson, and Tom Britnell. Please stand. Some of our teams join even larger consortia. This is the case for three of our PIs, Todd Mockler, Chris Topp, and Terry Woodford Thomas, 
who joined with 31 investigators from nine other Missouri institutions in a large $20 million National Science Foundation funded program called Missouri Transect. This project, which is led by the University of Missouri Columbia, of which we have at least four uh, representatives today, uh, this project is building infrastructure and knowledge to understand the impact of changing environments on agriculture and native landscapes. Already, this project has resulted in development and testing of instrumentation to better image roots, root metabolism in real time, and as the needs intensify for uh, lower water use in agriculture, understanding root biology will be an important route to develop new traits uh, that enable crops to use water more efficiently. With the Missouri Transect team of Todd Mockler, Chris Topp, and Terry Woodford Thomas, and Sandra Arango Caro, please stand up and be recognized. The Missouri Transect Project has brought us closer to key collaborators and partners like, like Robert Pless, a leading expert in computer vision and image analytics at Washington University. Ties have been strengthened, uh, most importantly, for the, in the case of Missouri Transect, with Mizzou. And this eventually helped lead us to our recently announced agreement to hire four joint faculty between the Danforth Center and Mizzou, two of which will be housed here and two of which will be housed on the Mizzou campus. So thank you, uh, Tom, Mark, and others at Mizzou uh, for making that happen. Our education and outreach program has never been stronger, thanks to the tremendous efforts of Terry Woodford Thomas, our Dreemeyer Director of Science Education. So let me introduce you to the STEAM team. Eight of our scientists working to engage more young women in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, or STEAM fields. In June, the team will lead Girls STEAM Ahead 2015, a partnership with the Girl Scouts of Eastern Missouri. I know we have a number who participated specifically in the Girl Scouts of Eastern Missouri here in the audience. Girl STEAM Ahead will bring 80 Girl Scouts from the city of St. Louis, St. Louis County, and rural areas to the community college labs at Bridge Park. Over three days, Girl Scouts will work with our scientist mentors to hone their STEAM skills by doing experiments that support creativity, build confidence, and promote communication. The STEAM team is Sona Pandy, Becky Bart, Andrea Eveland, our newest, uh, oops, excuse me, our newest investigator pictured right here with two Girl Scouts, Toby Kellogg, Sarah Fentress, Terry Woodford Thomas, Malia Guillen, and Tony Kuchon. Would you please stand and be recognized? Our role in building the region as a world center for plant science innovation is entirely collaborative and team-oriented. On our campus, Bridge Park now has, houses 14 companies in the St. Louis Community College lab training program. As many of you know, Bridge Park was selected as the new home for a major North American research center for the German seed company KWS. Yes, they wanted to be near the Danforth Center. Yes, they wanted to interact with our scientists and use our facilities. But they also wanted to be part of what they expressed as a unique St. Louis innovation ecosystem. Last week, I and many of you were able to attend the grand opening of their new laboratory, office, uh, and conference facilities over in Bridge. Very nice facility. It, it underwent a $6 million redesign and renovation, contains new labs and other, uh, other facilities uh, and that very importantly will house 75 new people to the region, to Bridge, uh, within the next few years. We're very excited about that. Although we're not making any formal announcements this morning, stay tuned because we will, over the next few months, uh, uh, look for some news about new companies and new organizations that are going to find their way to this campus. On the startup side, Helix Center, our neighboring plant and ag technology incubator run by the St. Louis Economic Partnership, achieved full occupancy in its phase one build out. This important Bridge Park sister facility plays a vital role in growing early stage companies. 
that will one day perhaps graduate to Bridge Park, three of our Helix tenants, Benson Hill Biosystems, Cultivat, and um, uh, Arvigenics, were either started by or have close research ties to past or present Danforth Center scientists. And we were thrilled to see Yield Lab, uh, Thad, congratulations. Uh, we were thrilled to see Yield Lab, an accelerator for ag startup companies, get off the ground at Helix uh, over the past 12 months. And we're proud to report that the success of the sixth annual Ag Innovation Showcase, held in September and attended by 350 investors, entrepreneurs, and strategic representatives in the ag tech space, uh, we were thrilled to host that for the sixth time here at the Danforth Center. Since inception, companies presenting at Ag Showcase have raised more than $360 million in financing. And two of our Bridge Park companies, New Leaf Symbiotics, uh, which recently closed a $17 million Series B round, and Symico, which shipped its first commercial product this year, uh, have been featured companies in the past. Uh, we look to the Ag Showcase not only as a way to promote the ecosystem here, but to attract companies from outside the region, build awareness, particularly among strategics and investment partners. So, in closing, I hope I've communicated adequately that the Danforth Center succeeds, that it delivers on its mission only when people with diverse backgrounds and talent come together for common purposes. The culture of collaboration, of we, is important to us. We talk about it and promote it constantly. It makes us unique in the scientific world. As we grow with the addition of the next building, due for completion in November, our challenge is not only to recruit the very best scientists, but to grow the very best teams. We seek not only high achieving researchers, but entrepreneurs who understand that turning discovery into impact requires vision, risk, and partnership. The expansion, the expansion project is about providing our current and future scientific teams with best-in-class facilities and equipment and with spaces that enable what is not currently possible. The expansion is designed to ensure greater impact in the years ahead, but this will not happen without your partnership and without your support. Thank you very much. Now, please welcome Molly Klein, chair, new chair, incoming, friends, uh, incoming chair of our Friends Committee, and Sam Fiorello, senior vice president and chief operating officer of the Danforth Center, as they join me on stage. Wow. Thank you, Jim. It's um, a real pleasure to be up here with you and Sam. I'm Molly Klein, and I'm a plant... Uh, science and agriculture advocate and community volunteer. And my husband and I, we've lived in St. Louis. This is our 32nd year and have raised two children. So we're pretty close to native and our kids are native St. Louisans. So I'd like to build on that. Wow, 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 what we just heard. Now I've never played any major sports in my life but I do know something about plant science, having been trained as one and having worked in that area. But you know what? We are major league in plant science. This team is going nowhere. We've got you. We are so glad that you are here. Did she just say we're and going nowhere? And thank you to our visionaries. Thank you. Yeah, no trading. You've, you've uh, won the World Series, the Super Bowl, et cetera. So now it's time. We've got a few minutes. Um, we've had some questions that were submitted uh, by our attendees. So what we're going to talk about right now, uh, the themes of these questions are uh, summarized, if you will, from what um, our attendees have, have mm -hmm. submitted ahead of time. So. Um, Jim, you just mentioned um, about the building expansion. And I've got to say, when I drive up and down um, Lindbergh Boulevard in the neighborhood here, 
um, it so seems like music to my ears, hearing those cranes and the noise and the rumble. And um, so expansion is huge. And then we've heard, uh, Sam, you know, your work at Bridge Park and with the partners, uh, what that's doing for innovation. So let's take this as a first uh, theme. So um, Jim, would you um, be able to provide a preview of what type of research, either continuing or new, will take place in this new edition? Certainly. Um, uh, and thank you, Molly, for hosting this Q&A. Um, I'm glad to be on the stage with you uh, between three ferns. <laughs> <laughs> They're green and growing. So the expansion. The expansion uh, is composed of three parts. There's the new building that everyone can see. There is the development of new technology facilities. And uh, most importantly, there's the addition of new scientists, up to 100 when we get full occupancy of the new building. What this is allowing us to do is to move into new territory and defend what we're good at. Another way of saying that is there are opportunities that we need different types of people, more people, and different types of space that we don't currently have to pursue. These include, for example, a concept that we've been uh, talking about with Todd Mockler and Tom Brittnell and several others about creating a computational crop improvement team. This is using big data as the driver to accelerate or fast forward crop improvement for both large row crops, uh, but very importantly for underserved food security crops. That's a big area, and we're going to carve out a lot of space for that purpose. Uh, I talked about the maker group. This is going to be more and more and more important. What you can do for $125 now is what Last week, we would have had to have paid $25,000 to purchase. It's another issue on the price of scientific equipment. It's kind of astronomical, but you get the point. What we can do is build equipment to suit. We can scale it because those little Raspberry Pi computers, those $35 microcomputers, uh, we can buy 150 of them for not too much money and build an incredibly powerful network of sensors, probes, cameras, uh, remote devices, all interacting wirelessly with our big computers here uh, to collect data, to uh, see things in real time, and to measure things that we simply couldn't do before. This will complement the bellwether phenotyping yeah, facility, which I, does a whole other set of things. So the, a maker lab or a maker mm -hmm. space is going to be an important part of the new building. Uh, we'll have labs that are configurable so that teams can come in, not just individual labs to stake out their own space. We'll have space that teams can come and use. And when those teams are done, or when they morph into something else, or when those teams uh, have delivered, another team can come in and use the space. So is everybody you know, fighting to sign up for the first space? I think. Uh, we have, a very, we, we have a very good facility in this current building. So we're, we're not quite like uh, certain universities where you're in a 75-year-old building and you know, you'll, you'll sell a few of your kids just to move out of that oh. space. Um, we, we, we have scientists who are reasonably happy in the space that they're in, though I think a few will move. And certainly as we hire, we'll put some new individuals and new teams in the space as well. So, so um, what do you think, um, Sam, that the new addition is going to do regards innovation and the effect on Bridge Park and potential yeah, partners? A couple of things, Molly. One is critical mass and density matters. In, in an innovation ecosystem, the more folks, the more activity, the more intellectual capital and more physical capital matters. And so our growth here will not only be great for the Danforth Center, but for this innovation ecosystem that we're building here. Some additional core facilities, uh, like Jim talks about, um, the maker groups, uh, uh, more space there and, and more uh, growth rooms and growth chambers will be vital as we um, fill out uh, Bridge Park number one and, and hope to build Bridge Park two and beyond. So um, 
Uh, more scientists, more intellectual activity, more infrastructure is vitally important to continue to grow this ecosystem. The interchange between the Danforth Center yeah. and that ecosystem, of which we're a part, but Bridge, for example, or Helix, um, it's, it's a, a, a critical symbiosis. We provide good ideas, sometimes at least, and talented people, and they start Take up companies. Take them to the next step. They can start companies okay. in either the incubator space or if they're you know, a, a high flyer from the get-go, maybe in Bridge. Um, but those companies and other companies in the neighborhood can come and use our facilities. We don't give it away to companies. They have to pay for it. But we have facilities that they would not otherwise be able to have access to in either proximity, quantity, or quality. Our greenhouse space, our growth chamber spaces, for example. So that really underscores this collaboration mm -hmm. of the region of the Danforth Center with partners. I think it does. Yeah. Um, before we leave this topic, just say a little bit more. Um, if you're projecting down the road, um, you know, your vision, what will maybe some of the headlines be coming out of the new center and all this research, the maker lab, the computational uh, area? Yeah. Uh, we, we, like everybody, like, like good things to happen. We, the things that, that we would define as mission impactful, we call those meaningful outcomes. Uh, so if a group of our scientists forms a company, we love it. We celebrate that. Uh, we, we put them up on a pedestal and we talk about it all the time. New company formation from our scientists and our technology. Uh, we expect that to happen more and more in the future. Uh, we have a mission to feed the world. That is translated through our science and our activity to improve the genetics of food security crops. We also contribute to improving crops like corn and soybean because much of the technology that we develop is applicable to all plants, food security crops in developing regions and large commercial crops as well. Those are headlines that we celebrate. Um, we'll clear across the finish line on projects that have been going on for eight years or so at the Danforth Center. Within the next couple of years, you'll see headlines there where we uh, uh, if things go according to plan, uh, where we'll solve a major virus disease problem in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we'll have uh, cassava that is more productive because we're providing tools to farmers in another project uh, to make it less labor intensive. That will be a big headline. I can well, go on. And, I can go on and, and on. that might move us to slightly another topic people have an interest in. This is my issue. I guard it closely. Um, the October issue last year of National Geographic, where um, there's a lot of statistics about global food need. You mentioned these mm -hmm. and preserving our environment and the Danforth <coughs> Center and the work on tomatoes is in here. So let's talk for a few minutes about sustainability and how the core research of the Danforth Center is geared to looking at sustainability in mm -hmm. terms of our environment <coughs> and producing more food. So, you know, what's happening with what you're doing on nutrient uptake in mm -hmm. plants, uh, stress and drought tolerance? Yeah. So we can distill down when we talk about sustainability in agriculture, in the domains that we work in here at the center, we can distill it down into a couple of categories. Water, nutrients, which is another way of saying fertilizer. <coughs> Excuse me. Pest control okay. and disease control that is um, less harmful to non-target organisms mm -hmm. and the environment more broadly. Uh, sustainability kind of distills down into a few categories like that. How can we produce what we need uh, without losing our topsoil or uh, mowing down more rainforest. Those are the big areas. Um, sustainability research that we do here, therefore, seeks to understand why plants are drought resistant when they are and why others are sensitive to drought. Again, that's important because for two reasons. 
A lot of our crops depend on rainfall. Rainfall is changing, at least the patterns of rainfall are changing, and they will continue to change in the future. That's going to put tremendous stress on agriculture. You're already seeing it in places in this country, like California, and it's already having effects on productivity and just the basic nature of agriculture. People will be surprised to learn, for example, that lettuce, most of which used to come from places like the Salinas area in California or the Imperial Valley under heavy irrigation, uh, because the price of water and the availability of water is becoming so high and restricted, lettuce is moving out of California. You know where it's moving to? Arizona. Does that make any sense? Uh, and a quick question for Sam, because I, I, I see we're going to be running out of time in a minute here. Um, Sam, how about at Bridge Park and with partners and at Helix? How does sustainability from this concept fit in, not the economics? So, so very much. You know, the targets are the yeah. same. For the innovative companies, they take the research from places like this and they uh, focus those on pain points in the world, issues like how do we get a plant to take nutrients up more efficiently. <laughs> two examples that Jim showed on the screen, two of our tenants, Simeico and New Leaf, are in a space called Biologicals. And they look at how plants interact with different microbes that are in the soil or in the air and how those interactions can help a plant be more healthy and more efficient. We have examples today. We are talking to a couple of other companies in that space that will likely put a presence here. You have um, early stage companies in Helix. So many of the Bridge Park tenants in the ag space that we focus on focus on those areas that are points of, of challenges in the world, and they're going to take that and turn them into products and services and make money, but also solve the world's great problems. And that's the continuum that we're part of that helps us achieve mission impact to improve the human condition. And we couldn't do it without this um, ecosystem, this community, and this partnership. And so that's why it's Again, so vital. Again, partnership, collaboration. And um, I, I just want us to have another comment. Um, again on partnership, and this would be an education before mm -hmm. we leave, because Jim, you touched on that. And we're hearing so much in our community about STEM or STEAM, uh, education equality for our area. Mm -hmm. Are we doing enough? Is the Danforth Center doing enough for the region in that? Uh, and why, no, why is not, it so we're, important? We're, we're not doing enough, but we're trying. Uh, we can't solve the problems of education in this region on our own, obviously. Um, but we have a contribution to make. Again, this is something that we talk about and do a lot at the Danforth Center. It might surprise some people, and this is unrelated to St. Louis, but it might surprise some people that many of the grants that we get for hardcore research also have education and outreach components built into them. It engages our scientists with schools, for example, uh, and it helps get what we're doing in a laboratory or out in a field distilled down so that the public can not only benefit it, but understand it. And if the public understands better science and technology, I think we're going to be in, in better shape. What are we doing in the region, though? The great need for education in this region uh, is in public education in underserved areas. And we all know where those are. City of St. Louis. North County. North County. Um, Ferguson, obviously, has been in the news. Ferguson schools are not the lowest achieving in the region, but there are great needs in and around the Ferguson area. Um, Terry Woodford Thomas, our director of science education, uh, is passionate about bringing science out of the Danforth Center and into underserved schools. If you plot the number of under sco underserved schools that we're moving into with programs like Green Means Grow, which is a relatively simple program that enables students and teachers to set up light banks and racks and grow plants. Just watching plants grow is incredibly <laughs> educating. It tells students it tells people where their food comes from and what it takes to produce food. Uh, we have programs like Mutant Millets 
This was initiated actually by Tom Brittnell when he was up at, at Cornell. Sounds like a comic book. <laughs> well, it's anything but. It, it um, served over 500 students this year, and it brings not just light banks and racks, it actually brings real science and real research, essentially crowdsourcing of research into the public schools. Now you've got schools who are not only getting familiar with plants and agriculture, but they're learning how to do science. Yeah. And if well, everyone understood how science works, um, um, I think we would be a little better off at least. I totally agreed. And before we close, Sam, um, how about Bridge Park? What, what's their contribution to so STEM I, I, and STEAM? I think the, um, well, I just came from a conference on innovation that uh, Wexford, the developer, held, and they had a speaker from the Brookings uh, named Bruce Katz, who who's, does a lot of work in these innovation communities of today and of the future. Maybe I'm stating the obvious, but he said, the communities that can figure out how to have a trained workforce are going to be the ones that win. If you don't get this right, St. Louis or Pittsburgh or Cleveland or wherever, you're going to fail. So this is a challenge for us. It's the right thing to do because every citizen should have an opportunity to achieve their, their full potential. But it's also the smart thing to do because when KDUS in the end, their biggest question was, can I find a skilled, trained, motivated workforce? We have to continue to work so that we can continue to answer. The, the, the job that Richard Norris and the community college does is vital and they're in Bridge Park and we're so proud of that partnership. The job that Terry Thomas and, and the rest do but as Jim said, there's a lot of work to be done. We've got to do it because it's right, and we've got to do it because if we don't, we're going to fall behind. So it's vital. Well, boy, um, I had more questions, but I think our time is up. But Jim would like to give you the um, opportunity to summarize, make any last comments, call to action. Well, I'll make one final comment. Uh, many of you have seen this virtuous cycle diagram that I've shown in years past, um, our, our um, flywheel that explains what makes the Danforth Center run and what promotes us and what catalyzes us to excel. There's a couple of pieces to it. We need best-in-class scientists. I think we have them and we're going to keep attracting them. Best-in-class scientists need best-in-class facilities. We're building them and we're maintaining them here at the center. Very important. Um, we need great science. That's done by great scientists in great mm -hmm. facilities. And then we need ways to take those discoveries and turn them into productive, important outcomes. That's why we're here. That's also why you're here. If we don't do those things, there is no reason anyone should look at the Danforth Center as a supporter, a volunteer, or a donor. But if we are doing those things right, you have a reason to be here. If you do your part, we can get better scientists, better facilities, we can do better science, and our outcomes will happen faster, they'll have more broad impact, which will give you more reasons and there'll be more friends of yours that you can bring in, which will help us increase our science, increase our outputs and impacts, um, and so forth and so on. I wanna just leave you with that thought. The team that we have here at the Danforth Center doesn't exist without the team out in the community. So thank you so much for all that you've done, for all of your support, the leadership uh, from Jim Knight, George, Jay, Jim, uh, on the volunteer community. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's been a real treat having you here this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you.